All righty. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm the uh, Tom Trepney, the chair for the National Sea Scout membership team. Uh, and tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about rechartering and uh, a few other topics. Sean, you can see that, right? Yep, you're good. All right. So, first of all, what's what's changing for rechartering? And uh, of course, top of mind is fees. So, um, as has happened over the last few years, the fees have, have will are increasing, and uh, you can see the program fee was seventy five. Now it's going to be eighty. Volunteers has gone up to sixty. That was probably that's you can see that's the biggest jump from last year. Uh, joining fee has not changed. Charter fee hasn't changed. Scout life hasn't changed. Um, I just want to clarify: program fee is for all scouts. So whether they're under eighteen or over eighteen, it's the the same program fee. They're not considered leaders or volunteers. So that's the fee structure. Um, I will say that some councils uh, charge what's called a council program fee on top of the national fee. So uh, those numbers that I showed you, 84 uh, Sea Scouts, it may actually show up a little different in your council if they do charge a, a program fee on top of it. But I wanted to remind folks that these dues are per person. Uh, it, they People pay once and they pay it through a uh, specific program where they're primary. Uh, the uh, uh, to, the cost to join an, an additional program is zero. So that's uh, that's primary and multiple are the terms we use. Uh, and so the example is, you know, if, if Sally's in a troop and wants to join Sea Scouts, uh, the additional cost is zero. So uh, uh, it's actually a, a great opportunity to uh, get folks that are currently in troops and existing scout units uh, joining Sea Scouts, a low, low cost of entry. And then the uh, a right, reminder too that Sea Scouts should be primary. So uh, it's uh, there's a rule and rules and regulations put out by BSA that says uh, Sea Scouts should be primary. And uh, there's a reference there. It's not not my statement. It's actually out of the the BSA uh, documents. And so um, so that's something that we always want to be a little conscious of. We're trying to. Uh, grow our membership, but when also when we can grow our primary members, it helps in how BSA views sea scouting and our numbers look better. So, but I, I do want to add a little caution here. Uh, don't just uh, get too aggressive. Um, certainly have scouts join ASAP. Don't sit on applications. It's whenever you have somebody ready to join, join right away. And I would say do that to take advantage of that zero cost of entry. But at recharter time is opportunity to, to swap uh, primary and, and multiple with a troop, but by all means coordinate with the troop, uh, particularly usually the committee chair, because you don't want the parents get and the, the scouts be caught in the middle of, of a, a tug of war there. So uh, it's usually pretty straightforward to have that conversation, especially when you have uh, a, a written BSA rule to go by and stand behind. So one other, the, the, another big change is around the process. So um, a big change is how when new members come in, so if they haven't been in scouting before, they will, uh, when they join, that'll be their anniversary month and, it'll, and they will pay for an entire year. So uh, if they join in September of this year, they're their anniversary will be next September. It won't be when your unit uh, anniversary is. So that's quite a bit different from previous years. You know, normally we do a pro rating. So now it's really simple. It's just it's you know it's eighty dollars to join Sea Scouts if they haven't been in Sea Scouts before. They pay the one time join fee, and it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, of course, existing members their anniversary date is going to stick with whatever it is today. So typically it's aligned with the recharter of the unit. Uh, and even new ships, um, well, I'll say on ex existing ships, whatever your recharter is, it's gonna stay the same. New ships, when they joined, 
then uh, when they got started, that's when their anniversary will be. So just a heads up, you may not necessarily be aligned with the rest of your accounts, but you'll probably be aligned with wherever your, your ship started. And then, I, and then the um, ship recharter, another big change here, ships can choose, do you want two methods, one of two methods, either go the old way where you collect all the fees from everybody and you submit as a unit, or you can actually elect to have individuals pay their and renew their own fees um, via credit card or manual payment themselves. So it does release the burden of all that um, collection of money and dealing with all that administrative work. Really the goal here is try to push that uh, more to the individuals and individuals are used to doing that because they, they're they members of a lot of things and uh, they know how to renew their memberships. So it's definitely a good change there. Um, in terms of our numbers and membership, uh, we have uh, a goal this year of reaching 5,000 scouts, 350 ships, and as of today, we're um, we're at 3565 and 335. So ship-wise, I think it looks very doable to make our end-of-year number. Scout-wise, it is uh, we're definitely not uh, lining up for that 5K number. So uh, you're going to hear me in the next few slides say get some more folks in your into your ships. Um, uh, I do want to say uh, and welcome the new ships uh, since our last uh, roundtable. Uh, I've listed them here. There's actually been quite a few, and it's been really great news for uh, for sea scouting. I want to welcome all these ships to to our fold. Um, and just some thoughts. So, continuously recruit new scouts and new leaders. It, there's it just if you stay on it and do it. Uh, regularly you'll you won't get into a bind at the end of the year when it comes to recharter try partnering with the troop uh and so as the, the troops they lose scouts they lose scouts because the older ones aren't interested in staying with the troop you guys know this tell your troops talk to your troops partner with them and expose sea scouting in this wonderful program we have to to other uh other folks in their scouting community so they can realize the continuum. And by all means, get on, be a scout. Go into, uh, there was a presentation at our last round table about getting on, be a scout. Um, we in the membership team, we look, we use be a scout all the time to try to place new recruits. We're getting them every day through the join page. And the best way for us to find us, find you is through the be a scout link. And so please, Get, uh, get registered at Via Scout and uh, do online registration, get online recharter. This is, uh, this is how folks who are want to go forward. Uh, the papers is really a, a pain. So I recommend going online. And if there's any concerns about rechartering for your unit, please ask for help. Don't just give up. Ask, tell, tell your council commodore, tell your uh, membership team lead, Tell, tell Ben, tell me, tell somebody, and we will get help. We've uh, done a lot of uh, ships that are struggling. We, we can find ways to help them. And Sean, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. So, oh. uh, <laughs> you're, doing so just, you're doing good for time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So I want to introduce the team real quick. This is uh, the folks I have working on the membership team, and there's a lot of letters there. But you can see the various states that we're covering. And that's a lot of territory, but I want to thank everybody for for uh, participating. And uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, leads coming through our join page and through the jamboree. And uh, it's been a, it's it, it, these guys these folks have put in a lot of effort to connect uh, individuals with ships. And um, I really want to thank them and for their efforts for starting new units. But but again, that be a scout link. Gosh, if you get out there and we can see you, it sure makes our job a lot easier. Um, and don't give up the ship. So thank you, Sean. Thank you. All right. Let's see here. I did have a, uh, a question come up. Uh, it says, when it comes to multiple registrations, do you see a lot of multi-council registrations? Uh, very few. I, I personally know of 
just a handful. So I, I normally don't see people uh, registering in across councils. And when they do, they there's really it's really hard to avoid the fees in those cases. But it can be done. You just it does take some council cooperation. All right. And then a uh, follow up to that. Another question they had was uh, for recharter method two. how does that work? There is a um, I haven't seen it in the online recharter yet, but I'm expecting that's where it will be. Is that a, there's an option to choose to uh, to let the individuals renew themselves or or for the, the ship to collect the fees. So look for that in the online recharter. All right. And and somebody whispered in my ear and says, check with your counsel if uh, if you have any more questions, but we'll we're here to help too. All right. Looks like that's it for the questions that have come up. Um, thank you, Tom. Great presentation. All right. Next we have uh Peter Sargent talking about marketing material. All right, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pete Sargent. I'm part of the National Sea Scout Committee. A national Resource Advisor. And I've been working very closely with Josh Gillen, who's our uh, chair, chair of the uh, Marketing and Communications Subcommittee of the National Sea Scout Committee. And we've uh, we wanted to push, we've had a lot of questions about improving the material on, on Sea Scout that's available on the BSA website that we can use for collateral. You know, pictures of Sea Scouts doing Sea Scout things, to be quite blunt. So we put together a little, some some information and put together a process to help us collect material like that. So I'm going to swap over. So, you know, the big thing to remember here is particularly Sea Scouts, skippers, mates, we're all ambassadors to all of scouting. Let's be really clear about all of scouting. When we're there, I mean, I personally have gone to some Cub Scout events recently in my Sea Scout uniform, and I get more questions asked about that than anything else. Um, there are very specific guidelines for posting uh, to meet the BSA brand, uh, and the, you, all the requirements are, are can be found in a variety of places. And what this present, what we put together here, was this something to help kind of filter it down as a quick run of this thing. So. You know, we need folks photos of Sea Scouts in action. We got if you've ever been to the BSA uh, marketing site, you know we have lots of pictures of Sea Scouts in uniform. But we need them doing stuff, having fun. So activity shirts, you know, that's one thing to worry about. Uh, the types of photos we need, uh, everything, to be quite blunt every possible activity you can think of and show them having fun or doing something serious. I mean, this guy here is clearly concentrating on, on wrapping a sail, clearly in deep concentration. So this is great. Um, make sure the faces are visible. You know, what, you know, the question is what makes a good photo? Some of us have, you know, I know I've been guilty of it. I, Take the picture at just the wrong moment and somebody is looking the other way, right? Uh, and they're doing something, right? Um, I I've always loved this quote, Ansel Adams, who was a famous photographer in her day, you know, remember knowing where to stand is important. So if you can get close, it's great. Um, but just make sure you know know where, to, where you're standing. Also pay attention to the background. Some unfortunate uh, pictures have been taken that have unfortunate things going on in the background. Um, now here comes the kicker. This is, this is where the paperwork comes in. In order to be available as collateral, collateral on the BSA website, every picture has to be accompanied by a talent release form. And I'm gonna give you the link towards the end of where to find that. And basically, if they're under 18, the parents have to sign it. And if as well, so, you know, clearly a talent release form it basically says BSA has permission to use the photo. 
Um, I know we were talking, I was talking to this with the Coast Guard Auxiliary the other night. They have the same requirement, by the way. So if you want to submit it to two places, so be it. Um, so as an example, it, you know, talent release form on the left, there's a QR code. Take a picture of it. It'll take you right to the talent release form on BSA File Store. And there's the link below. So we did that. Now, here comes the process change. This is something Josh and I uh, work together on. We have a process to submit pictures and forms to us, and then we can get them to national. So there is a Google form out there now. Again, QR code will take you to that QR form. It's going to ask you a bunch of information about the picture itself. And it's going to ask you to upload the talent release form and the picture itself. And that will come to us and we will we will screen them and send them off to national. Questions can be addressed, you know, to either to Josh and there's his contact information or myself. Any questions? Uh, not seeing anything pop up. All right. Thank you, Peter. Hmm. Up next, we have. And TW is on. So. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, okay. I see him. Hold on. Let me. Uh... There we go. All right, up next we have uh, T.W. Cook uh, talking about some uh, commissioner items. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> Sorry to be a little late. Are you good? Um, main thing I wanted to cover is to let everyone know, I think everyone's aware that there is a commissioner's week at Philmont Training Center, the first week of PTC every summer. <clears throat> We're going to try a new thing this summer which is um, a session on commissioner topics for older youth programs. So we're we'll collaborating with the venturing and exploring folks, but really trying to explore the, the issues and unit service <clears throat> around specifically Sea Scout ships, among others. We'll have breakout sessions that are Sea Scout specific. So if you're in a role like a Commodore or commissioner uh, for Sea Scouts, you might want to take a look at that. <clears throat> and if you're not, you might want to come anyway, because. Commissioner Week is really useful. There are a lot of great people there. It's a good place to make contacts. The National Key 3 is usually present. So it's a good way to get caught up on the rest of BSA. All right. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I did end up having some questions come up. Um, first one is a uh, second QR code says that they need permission. Oh, I'll, I'll fix that momentarily. Okay. Uh, next is, uh, is the Google form available for those without permission? Um, that's the same question, so I will fix that momentarily. Okay. And the next question is, uh, can the Coastie form be used in lieu of the BSA form? No. All right. Making my way through these. And let me clarify, are the U.S. Coast Guard media release and BSA talent release interchangeable? No, because one is you're releasing the, you're giving permission to the U.S. Coast Guard, and the other is you're giving permission to the Boy Scouts of America. Two different forms. All right. And then somebody asked if these slides, presentations are available on cscout.org. I will be... Uh, sending out the slides um all the presenters will will send me a copy of their slides and i can i can share them with uh everybody all right uh let's see here up next uh we got cynthia cyrus talking about kodiak challenge Good evening, everyone. 
I am the National Venturing Training Chair, and as part of that role, have been involved over the last several years in a bit of a reformulation of Kodiak challenge and iteration, but not a hugely transformative one. But one of the questions that's come up several times is whether, uh, whether ships can do a Kodiak challenge. And the answer is absolutely, and we would love for you to do so. And, Sorry. Um, the Kodiak Challenge is a leadership course that's designed to be delivered at the unit level. It is intended to be an adventure with a purpose. It is uh, going to take place in a trek that is designed by the participants themselves. And the leadership um, information is layered over top of the adventure that your group is having. We think of it as experiential um, and the goal within a Kodiak challenge is to introduce the same kinds of leadership skills that we have in our other BSA courses, but to do them in ways that flow organically from the experiences that are happening as uh, you go about the adventure that you've planned. So treks themselves can be any of a variety of things. There have been uh, treks to the city to go to a series of museums. There have been treks that are backpacking treks in the middle of the mountains. There could be water treks. There could be a variety trek where you decide that each day you're going to do a different kind of activity. So it can be a range of different kinds of front country and back country environments. But the trek itself is just the adventure and having fun frame in which those teachable moments of the course actually occur. And so as the adventure unfolds on the first day, you'll do communications. And on the second day, you'll talk about stages of team development and so on. And I'll go through the seven skills of Kodiak here in just a moment. But unlike some of the other courses in BSA, this is not a here is the syllabus, please quote it exactly kind of course. It's really meant to be adaptable in the field so that you can deliver the information at the moment at which it is most relevant. And so I think about the teaching of Kodiak as involving these three strands that you're seeing on the slide. There are the teachable moments, and I'll give an example from a backpacking trek that I was on. Um, we were in our, really our first day of backpacking, and our group was uh, sort of of mixed talent. I had a couple of gazelles, and I had the younger scouts who were struggling a little bit on this backpacking adventure. And so we got to a hill, and it was a steep hill. And my gazelles took off. They went charging up that hill and the rest of the group fell further and further behind. So that's a teachable moment. And so what we did, we got the slower group about halfway up the hill. I called a water break. The youth who was our uh, crew guide then was, uh, and I did a little bit of brainstorming and when about 15 minutes later, our gazelles came back to check on us. My youth guide gave the lesson on inclusiveness that's normally on day four of the course, but it was exactly relevant like right then. What did it feel like when you were leading but nobody was following? What did it feel like to be left behind? And then as the adult, I did the teachable moment of that was actually a safety concern and we really need to think about it going forward. So you capture people at the moment of doing something really good. Hey, I saw that you waited and made sure that we had everyone who was in the restroom. I really appreciate that. And it includes the teachable moments where the gazelles took off and we needed to give them a chance to really think about what leadership really looks like. The course is also supplied with formal games and activities. And each one of the themes in the course has an array of what we would think of as the regular curriculum, a chance to do something and then reflect about what you just did. 
So if you did a game, then the question would might be like, who led? How did that get decided? Did you do any planning? What was the end result? What would you do differently next time? So a series of questions to really guide how people are thinking about the tasks that they're undertaking. And then there are the more formal lessons and discussions. Um, and uh, those are usually taught in the form of I ask, or my, my crew guide actually, asks a bunch of questions because if the participants are telling you the leadership lesson, that's more likely to stick with them in the long run. So I like to say that these three kinds of activities are really balanced the teachable moments, the games and reflections, and then the discussions that you have are where the leadership lessons of the course really get managed. So why do a code yet? Well, for one thing, it is great for unit cohesion. It's transformative. When each of the participants in your course have had a chance to be the leader of the day, and when all of them have shared this experience of thinking about the strategies of leadership and followership that are important to running a ship, they've got that ability to really work in a more um, norming performing realm in, uh, as a unit as a whole. The individuals also grow a lot over the course of the week and you build up a real sense of team identity. My crew, shown here, like to say it's way more than just another week of camp. It's really doing an, in, uh, an incredible amount of learning and growing. So in the overall BSA leadership continuum, um, Kodiak sort of stands a little bit to the side. We do require that uh, the youth who are participating have participated in an ILS whatever, uh, for troops, crews, or ships as a prerequisite to Kodiak Challenge. But otherwise, you can really fit this in at any point in the development of your le youth leadership. And that lets you, uh, our crew has decided that they would like to do a Kodiak on an every other year basis so that they keep their newer members sort of caught up with the leadership skills that are important when you really want your youth to be leaders and in charge. So uh, Kodiak really is different in its contextual lessons and the idea that the takeaways are coming often from the participants. Like, what did we learn about this? Or what would we like to do differently tomorrow? Um, and so that active and experiential field-based learning it's a little bit more fun than sitting and watching PowerPoint. I like to say this kind of lecture is exactly the wrong way to teach you about Kodiak, but it is, it's the way to get the word out. Um, and Kodiak is flexible. You adapt to the needs of the moment or the circumstances that unfold and you give the lesson that's really relevant in the moment. Also, there are only a few portions that must be delivered verbatim. It's very lesson focused. We want people to have the takeaways and we're a little bit less concerned about the delivery format. So as I said, there are seven skills that you work on over the course of the Kodiak Challenge and they're laid out so that there's a planning day, which I call day zero, which happens before you're actually headed out into the field. If you were getting together a kayak trip down at the ocean front, um, that would be the day where you're talking about which campground you want to go to and how you're going to get the kayaks there, but also what their vision of success is for what a week week long course is going to look like and um, what they want to accomplish individually and as a group as they go through the course. Then the other skills are the sort of standard BSA five communications, stages of team development, inclusiveness, values and ethical decision-making and servant leadership. And at the end, we have a sort of enhanced um, service project that we call the Kodiak contribution. And that's something I'm glad to talk with individuals about if you're really curious. Staffing is pretty simple. Um, you need uh, your young adult staff in that 14 to 20 year old, those are the people who are running the course. My job as the advisor to a Kodiak 
is to make sure that my youth are set up for success, but it is actually my youth guide who's going to be working with the participant who's learning their leadership skills. And it's my youth guide who's going to be doing the mentoring and planning with the participant of the day as they go through. The youth need to be familiar with the syllabus and they really do need to know how to facilitate, how to ask more than tell. Um, and they do need to follow the syllabus, but not verbatim. They also need to be ready for the trek. There, you don't want somebody who's not up to the adventure that the group has chosen. That said, treks that are, and we want to paddle, you know, we're gonna go all the way up to Canada. It's gonna be brilliant. There needs to be enough space in the day that they're not gonna be cranky about having the leadership part of the program. So sometimes those adventures, they just need to dial back a notch so they're not over the ability of all of the participants. There are uh, requirements for three, oops, sorry, three adult staff. Um, and if you are doing a co-ed trek, then you need your co-ed staff as you would expect. We would like staff to be graduates of a previous Kodiak but that isn't a requirement. There are plenty of people to help mentor a group that's the first in council to offer a Kodiak. So overall, there is no maximum course size, but the individual groups going through a Kodiak need to be somewhere between five and eight participants with a couple of guides, uh, that is youth leaders, to work with each of those groups. Um, and so it's a fairly straightforward course to offer. It's really brilliant. Uh, it's fun for the youth. It gives you a variety of strategies to reinforce those leadership lessons. And if you have any questions at all, I am glad to take them either tonight or uh, by email or phone. I am at so many kazoos at gmail.com. Yeah, I did get caught up at Jamboree. Um, and I've given my phone and text, and I'll be sending Sean my slide deck so you can get my contact information there. So that's a little introduction to Kodiak Challenge. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you. It is a great course. I've I participated in a couple of them. Um, in fact, we had one that had 128 participants. That was rough, <laughs> but it was fun. You need more adults if you're going to do 128. Persons. Yeah, we had a lot of adults too. <laughs> we had an army of staff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see if we have some questions. Uh, somebody said, I am interested in hosting a Kodiak challenge. How do I get started? Right. Um, if you reach out to me, I can send you links to the training materials that you can use for staff training. I will be offering, so once upon a time, we used to call them course director conferences, and we have rebranded those to be Kodiak orientations. Um, I know that there are a couple of those that are being offered um, in the fall in an in-person environment. I'm going to be running another Kodiak orientation uh, that's sort of three and a half hour training to get you ready to run your own in January on Zoom. Again, if you email me at the so many kazoos at gmail.com, I can get you put on the list for that. Um, or you can just get a copy of the syllabus. Um, we are going through the final, final reviews of uh, like formatting and those kinds of things. So the revised syllabus, I'm told, should be coming out soon. If you need the current copy in its beta form, it doesn't have the pretty logos, but it is pretty much uh, what's going to be the approved thing once it comes off the docket. So um, yeah, get in touch. All right, thank you. All right, up next, we got uh, Jim Deaker to talk about CBadge. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Deeker. I am the National Sea Badge Coordinator, and I'm having trouble with my mouse. To get the slides up. Well, you're sharing your screen, you just need to 
Yeah, I just there. can't get it to go to. Here we go. All right. Ah, I've gone too far. Okay. Let's start again. <laughs> well, has anybody seen anything? He scroll down. Or uh... don't. Here we go. Sorry for the technical issues, folks. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the state of sea badge. I think everybody here knows what sea badge is, but basically what sea badge is designed to do is to give the adults the tools to give to the youth to enable the youth to run the program. And it is open to anybody over the age of 18, regardless of what program of scouting they, they are in, whether it's Cub Scouting, Scouting, BSA, Venturing, Exploring, and particularly Sea Scouts. But it's designed to give them the tools, give the adults the tools to give to the youth to enable them to run the program. I want to give a big bravo Zulu to Grace and her staff and the 35 participants of SB71 Puerto Rico, which just completed this last weekend. This was the very first Sea Badge course in Spanish. Um, and in July, we didn't even know if the course was going to go because of the lack of registration. But I'm glad to say that we did have 35 participants in the course. It was an in-person course at the scout reservation there in Puerto Rico. And from everything I've been able to gather so far, everyone had a great time and a great experience. And it's been a long time goal to have Sea Badge taught in Spanish. So it's really great that this inaugural Spanish speaking Sea Badge course is now in the books and a success with 35 participants. The best news is perhaps that Puerto Rico is solidly behind sea scouting and want to grow the program. They even have a waiting list for the next sea badge course in Puerto Rico. And I expect to see some great things coming out of uh, Puerto Rico over the next 18 months as the uh, participants work on their log books. For upcoming courses, we have a course that starts in just less than two weeks at the summit, Sean is the course director. Registration for it is now closed. It is an in-person course and the uh, crews have already started to meet. Matter of fact, one of the crews is meeting as we speak in this round table. Um, so we've got 27 participants in that course. Uh, we've lost nine. Um, but we're expecting to see some great things. Time is even built into the schedule so that I can finally take the big zip at the summit without bumping some youth or standing in line for three hours. So I'm excited about that part. We also have another in-person course coming up in November in the Capital Areas uh, Council of uh, Texas. David Aronson is the course director for that. I have not heard numbers recently on that course, but that should be a great course uh, with all the talent that we have in sea scouting in Texas. Then next spring, we have two virtual courses. We have a course uh, that will be uh, directed by Nina Boone um, in January and the first weekend of February. And that course is via Zoom. And at the staff meeting last night, we already had 39 participants signed up for that course. So I'm expecting great things from that course. Wonderful staff looking forward to that course as well. And then in April, Jacques Villar is hosting a course from uh, 
Western LA Council. Um, that's SB 73, uh, California 24. Um, that will also be via Zoom. Now, those are the courses that are currently scheduled. I am anxious to receive many more uh, requests for authorization for more courses. Uh, but remember, the timelines are important uh, as far as getting approval before uh, the course uh, gets underway. Um, so you need to get those requests in soon if you hope to do anything in the spring. Uh, right now, I'm expecting to see more coming in for next fall at this point. Um, if you want a sea badge course in your council and in person one or someplace nearby in person find a potential course director put him in contact with me put her in contact with me and let's get the ball rolling so we can have a successful sea badge experience um and uh with that i just want to thank everybody that has participated in Sea Badge in the past. Special shout out to Grace and her crew, um, and hope to see everybody wearing the Trident in the near future. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I guess I should it's... ask if there's any questions. Oh, yeah. Not seeing any. Come in. All right. It is nice though to see uh, a lot more of the the sea badge tridents on uniforms um, recently. So um, it's getting out there. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, for the group, um, I had some uh, questions that come up that maybe somebody here might be able to answer. Was uh, is there any updates on the Sea Scout manual? Um. I saw that question from uh, Neil Smith, uh, and I believe uh, we're pretty close in uh, completing the draft of the, uh, I believe it's the 17th edition. Uh, I'll uh, get some more visibility on that uh, later this week. Um, and what, what were some of the other questions in that? Uh, another one was uh, um, updates on uh, boat insurance contracts. Uh, yeah, uh, that's another one uh, we, we've had. We were working with the uh, national insurance folks and um, provided them with some information regarding um, uh, boat insurance, and uh, they have not gotten back to us on that. And I uh, believe, uh, along with some additional questions from Neil, there was, uh, uh, a, 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 an up he was looking for an update on SEAL. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So the, the latest on SEAL is that we've completed uh, a, a, a draft of the point paper uh, that we'll be sending up to national. And uh, we're refining uh, the latest uh, iteration of that point paper. And uh, my goal is to get it to the national Sea Scout director and my volunteer boss uh, by the second Friday in October in advance of an in-person a national program committee meeting uh, later that month. So uh, we are uh, requesting that the program uh, be uh, reinstated. Uh, and of course, uh, we're also recommending that it be uh, run by a council. So uh, we'll you know, run it up the flagpole and uh, we believe that we've made some uh, uh, cogent arguments to uh, bring back the SEAL program uh, along with uh, addressing some concerns uh, that uh, we had in the past and in previous courses. All right, oh, looks like I got another question. Uh, another question, uh, thank you, uh, Ben, for those answers. Uh, another question is, uh, if a council does not have a Commodore, how do the ships get information from national with no more territory Commodores? Over to you, Peter. Uh, Peter, I think you're no sounds coming through. We're trying to uh, publicize it in at least three places. Um, one is obviously we put we're getting more frequently by putting news articles on cscout.org, so you can find you can check there. We'll put something on Facebook. 
and we have a direct contact mailing list that you can subscribe to off of cscout.org uh, to get direct mails to, to a preferred email address. Uh, that same email address um, that I gave you earlier will work for that because, you know, as Ben reminds me, that's my job is to work with all the councils across the country. And I, I think uh, a more, uh, in addition to what Peter sh uh, shared with uh, you all, um, a council that has a sea scout ship without a council commodore, uh, the, uh, the scout executive, uh, or at least the vice president for program should be encouraged to uh, uh, appoint one so that you have someone at the council level promoting the sea scout program. And uh, so, and uh, once, uh, we uh, have an identified uh, council commodore from a council, um, and then uh, along with their contact information, then we can provide uh, uh, information directly to him or her. So even if a ship, uh, even if a council has one ship, it, it would be in the council's best interest to go ahead and formally appoint a council commodore so that uh, that individual becomes the Scott executives and the council's uh, representative in promoting uh, our program. All right. Uh, and then one more question and then we'll move on. Uh, will there be another older youth program conference at Philmont in the next few years? My understanding is that, well, TW had mentioned that during commissioner's week, there may be an opportunity for uh, the older youth uh, uh uh, you know, scouters involved, scouters and youth members involved in the older youth program to get together in Philmont. Uh, I know that my counterpart in venturing, Julie Dalton, uh, has reached out to me and uh, Greg Martin exploring about the possibilities of having a uh, older youth uh, seminar uh, at Philmont sometime uh, during the summer. Um, there is, as I mentioned earlier, a in-person a, a national uh, program development committee and that may be a topic of discussion uh, during that session. So there is talk about having an older youth uh, uh, conference at Philmont sometime next year. Awesome. All right, uh, up next we got our uh, BSA safety moment. For your life jacket to work, you first must have the right type and make sure it fits correctly. There are many different styles and types of life jackets. Remember, when purchasing life jackets, the lower the number, the better the life jacket. There are four different types. Always check the tag to make sure the life jacket is a Coast Guard approved personal flotation device. After you've selected the correct type of life jacket for your event, make sure it fits correctly. Be sure all straps and buckles are snug and secure. If you can't make your life jacket fit snugly, then it's too big. If you can't comfortably put it on and fasten it, the life jacket is too small. Another way to make sure you have the correct size is to try and lift the life jacket off your buddy by the shoulder straps. If you can raise it upwards more than a few inches, try on a smaller size. Remember to always have your life jacket on before you set foot on any docker boat. After all, we float much better when we're wearing our life jackets. These safety moments are brought to you by Sea Scouts, part of Boy Scouts of America. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, let's see here, more questions. Um, I don't know if Ben, if you wanted just to respond to those questions, uh, typing or. Uh, well, what's the question? All right. Well, the first one is, uh, is there any established partnership with any scuba certification agencies, PADI, SSI, SDI? Um, I was told by an old, older quartermaster that PADI used to have a discount program with the scouts, but I haven't been able to track anything down. Well, to my knowledge, we don't have a formal uh, relationship with any of those organizations at the present time. 
All right. And the next one says, our council exec refuses. We have three ships, Council of the West, Alan Endicott, uh, Mark Port's former TT2 Commodore request, was refused, ship 1000. The Neptune of Provo tried before that. Um, I'm not really sure what what the question is, though. Well, it sounds like the council scout exec or, uh, refused to appoint a uh, council commodore. Is that what I'm getting at? Uh, is that how I am? Uh, I think that's how I'm interpreting that question. And uh, then okay. that might be something where um, Tim Anderson can get engaged or uh, maybe Peter. Uh, I was going to say, send me, send me the send me the information of who the council scout executive is the council president and the council vice program vice chair of program so so whoever and, and we'll probably engage tim but we'll start there yeah so whoever uh, sent that uh, was it donna strong who asked that question just if she if she can pm uh, peter with that information then we can go ahead and start um uh you know making some inquiries yeah All right. Oh, yeah. Don, uh, raise your hand. So, yeah, it's them. All right. Uh, up next, we have the uh, National Commodore Minute, uh, Ben Farrell. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us for our quarterly Sea Scout uh, roundtable. And uh, we, a lot of great information was uh, shared uh, with uh, all hands, and I want to thank our speakers and our guests for uh, making their presentations. And it's uh, always nice to get together and get up to date information as to what we're uh, what we're doing. Uh, summer was a fun filled activity for everybody in scouting. Uh, we had Sea Scouts uh, in, involved in the National Jamboree at Vesey and. Uh, uh, World Jamboree, uh, we, we've had uh, Sea Scouts uh, having fun uh, underway and even trekking through uh, Philmont and uh, Swamp Base again. And uh, so uh, it, it was great to see uh, a lot of posts on Facebook and social media on the many things that um, uh, Sea Scouts uh, had, had accomplished uh, this year, not only having fun, uh, but also working with our other other members of the of the scouting family and venturing and scouting uh, uh, BSA and, and Cub Scouts, especially uh, helping them work on their uh, water base activities. So now that the summer is behind us, uh, we're getting into the traditional activities that uh, fall uh, brings, and that is uh, recruiting uh, members uh, uh, to the Sea Scout program and uh, rechartering. And uh, we want to encourage uh, all of our unit leaders to uh, get a handle on rechartering so that um, uh, you're not uh, at the bottom of the pile, if you will, in your council scout office and, and uh, driving uh, Tom Trefney uh, and, and me up a wall trying to chase down numbers. But uh, uh, it, it's gonna be a challenge uh, again, as always. And uh, Tom did an excellent job in uh, describing what the process is going to be uh, uh, this coming year. So I would encourage uh, all of you, in addition to having attended our national uh, Sea Scout Roundtable, uh, to attend your district roundtable meetings so that you can get up to speed on the local council requirements for uh, rechartering so that uh, uh, you won't be caught short in uh, at the last minute in, in submitting your paperwork and funds and, and that sort of thing. Uh, also want to encourage you to continue your uh, interaction and uh, reach out to uh, the local uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Power Squadron, uh, especially if uh, the Auxiliary is uh, sponsoring any um, safety at sea events. Uh, you know, the fall time period is also an opportunity for training and, and fun type training. You, you heard a brief from Jim Deeker on Sea Badge, and we've had a couple of uh, multi-council events this past couple of weeks on safety at sea uh, that's been hosted by uh, the Coast Guard uh, Auxiliary. Uh, I think my final uh, uh, charge to all of you is uh, make sure that we keep safety in mind 
and, and youth protection. And uh, those are two major touch points uh, of the uh, BSA uh, considering the events of the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I think uh, many of our, uh, if not all of our uh, Sea Scout leaders, both youth and adults are uh, up to speed on youth protection. And I'm, I'm very happy and very proud of uh, what you all have been able to accomplish in the area of safety and youth protection. But uh, those two uh, uh, main topics uh, need to be at the forefront of everything that we do. So uh, anyways, thank you for uh, what you're doing for scouting and for the Sea Scout program and for what you're doing in your local communities uh, to promote uh, recreational boarding safety. So. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ben. Any questions? Any last minute questions, Sean? Um, not seeing anything pop up. I do have uh, one participant raising their hand, uh, Josh Henson. So let's bring on so he can ask a- Hello, can you hear me? Yep. You can? Yeah. I don't see I don't see myself up there. I've been listening. Um, I have a quick question. I'm the troop, uh, I'm sorry, the ship, committee chairman for ship 1176 in the national capital area council uh, we just had a wonderful event in august and my son wrote up a wonderful write-up of it with a lot of pictures and he sent it to what he found online which was a national newsletter and we got a response that well we're not doing the national newsletter anymore and i paused and said why not this is a great thing are there i don't know why they stopped doing it if it was a lack of volunteers, I'll volunteer. But is there any chance of having this national newsletter revived? Apparently, it hasn't been around for over a year now. Uh, any well, thoughts on that? Well, uh, we, we do have a member. Well, Evan, can you talk about the, the efforts to get uh, the national newsletter up and running uh, again? I mean, the... yeah, so currently the quarter deck is working on having a newsletter published and we've already wrote our first issue and that's going to come out soon and that'll feature like all events that are going on um, and stuff like that so um, and how, how thing... do i submit our our event for the newsletter for the next issue okay so one thing that we have through the form is um okay so currently we have an event promotion form um which would be the first part which is any flyers you have if it was before an event um, one thing we're trying to develop is something for post-event, which is kind of what you have, so we can have something that can feature you guys. So we'll put that up sometime soon. Um, but at least for any upcoming events, uh, fill out the event promotion form, and we'll have that to put in the newsletter and other things uh, across our social media platforms. Okay. So if I want to submit something to the newsletter... Uh... If you want to submit something to the newsletter for now, um, if you could email national.boson at cscott.org, and we can put it in something. Okay. Uh, Evan, I appreciate the yeah. answer, but you speak so fast, I couldn't write that down. To, I, I, I email it where? Uh, can you, uh, what, what did you, what did you type that in? in yeah, I'm sorry, can you, say that, can you say it one more yeah, time? I'll type, it, I'll type it in for you. Yeah, type it in chat. In chat, okay. And, you know, I'm an older guy. I'm not sure I understand the concept of chat as well as these young guys. Oh, uh, <laughs> national.boson at cscout.org, right? You found Brent. it. You got it. Yep. 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 Yeah, yeah, Peter just sent it in the chat. Yeah. At Sorry, C I haven't been able to. National.boson at cscout.org. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. And uh, Evan, congratulations yep. on your new position. Thank you. All right. Uh, now we do have a few. Um, uh, who was the speaker? Is the question? Uh, Douglas yeah, that was, Allen. Uh, that was that was Josh Henson. I. I Okay. It was, yeah. And then what is then, the URL for the event? Form, I wasn't able, form? Yeah, as far as that goes, I wasn't able to put it in the chat, but Peter said that he would be able to put it on the C Scout website. Um, so we'll probably put that up soon and it'll be there. And then somebody asked, is anyone going to be at Fall Fest in St. Louis this weekend? If so, we will see you there. 
Sounds like a great event. All right. Um, All right. Just uh, one other thing. Uh, uh, we have a tech talk coming up next week, Peter. Correct. Okay. Can can you share that information? Just kind of briefly tell everybody what we got going. Certainly. Let me get to where I can read it again. Um, it's basically we're going to have. Um, We're going to have Robin Pope, who is a member of the National Sea Scout Committee, but he's also, uh, among other things, a uh, an avid uh, paddlecraft boater. But he's also director, deputy director of U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary's Recreational Boating Safety Outreach. And he's going to speak about trends in recreational boating fatalities and how to prevent them. And that will be coming on. Uh, You'll be receiving, for those of you who have subscribed to the cscout.org mailing list, you'll be getting a mailer from that. Uh, you can find the information on as one of the news articles currently up on cscout.org as well. And there's a Facebook post as well. Again, it's a webinar like this, and uh, we hope to see you then. It is 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central, 7 Mountain, 6 Pacific, and I can't do the math for Hawaii right now. <sighs> I think it's what five hours behind me. And... Yeah, I think there's. I think I think we're all correct right now, but we're going to change here as soon because they don't do stay like saving. They don't do savings time. They don't like to play the game. Hmm. They're on island time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, move on. Uh, next up, we have the National Bosun's Minute with uh, Evan Na Evan Nazareth. Okay, so yeah, hello everyone. Um, so kind of the main points that I wanted to reemphasize in my minute are most of the stuff we've covered tonight. Um, the most important thing is to spread the word about Sea Scouts in your council. Um, I would challenge you all to like inspire other local leaders to try and start new ships up, if not uh, being a part of your own ship, um, if that is what works best for the time. Uh, but really try and get the word out. Wear your blues um, whenever you go to training, such as Wood Badge, IOLS, other things that you have going on. Um, and act, try and make sure that you're being proactive rather than reactive for membership and stuff like that. Um, as far as other things go, we have an amazing program. We've had a lot of great long cruises over the summer, and we truly appreciate all of the youth and adult involvement um, in supporting these events. Uh, we've had a lot of great activities. Our bosun's made of communications. Katie has been doing a great job of featuring um, everyone on the Instagram, and seeing, we've been really happy in seeing you guys' events. Uh, we also have that event promotion form now that'll be up on the Sea Scout website soon, so we can get the word out um, about your guys' events and get um, other Sea Scouts to attend your events as well. Um, additionally, one thing I wanted to reemphasize is I've taken Kodiak um, through a venturing event before, and that was a lot of fun, and I would really suggest uh, having a course within your ship or council. Um, it's a lot of fun. I'll be visiting one soon um, coming up. Uh, yes, and then also I'll be going to Davy Jones Rendezvous this weekend, which is a really big Sea Scout event hosted by my council, and I'm really excited for that. Um, and I hope everyone has a great weekend and a great night. Um, additionally, again, my email is national.boson at cscout.org. If anyone has any questions or wants to send um, send anything, um, just let me know. But yeah, that's all for me. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Let's see if there's any other last minute questions coming up. I don't see anything coming in. All right. Um, oh, Skipper Bill Murray Murphy raised their hand. Let's get to here. I'll bring them in. Um, the um, I got an email from Walt for I guess a uh, meeting that's in October. Um, is there, I don't recall getting an email for this one, or at least not close to the event like this to be not buried down in my email. Is there an email list to, to get on or is it sent to a national email list or it's, it's not coordinated. It's part of the, if you go up to the top of cscout.org, you'll see the words mailing list and you subscribe through that. All right. So you don't pull the registered leaders from the ships from the national database. No. 
wouldn't that be an easier way to go? No. We're I mean, trying. I wouldn't know to be here if I didn't have someone else tell me to be here. If you guys have access to the national database. But it, but it doesn't work is the problem. Yeah. Uh, we Skippers change. Yeah. We, <laughs> we have, we have, we tried that a year ago and we got 75% bounces. Well, I mean, it's, if the ship's not active or whatever, I mean, to be registered as the, one of the key three, you're registered I, as the key I'm three. Just telling you what, I'm just telling you what happened. But if, right. if you, if tscout.org and subscribe, then uh, we will capture your information. Um, and um, uh, yeah, a, a lot of the contact information, um, yeah, you remember, you got to remember that, well, uh, the, the situation at National and uh, a lot of council staffs, it's, it's reduced manning and they're doing the best they can to update databases. And uh, so if uh, what we discovered that uh, if there's a number that's been trans, uh, transposed or uh, spelling errors in the, um, in the body of the email address, I mean, that's how we got a 75% bounce back on uh, a lot of the communications that we sent out. Uh, you know, and uh, this is an area that we are trying to uh, address, but, um, uh, you know, you were able to get on today and we're, and we're glad that you were, uh, you got the word. And well, uh, I mean, I only got it from another skipper who's in my ship, who's yeah. part of another ship. So well, word of mouth seems like a very 1970s version of communication. Yeah. Well, we understand. Yeah. And, uh, 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 and I think we, we did a pretty good job in trying to explain to you some of the challenges that we're, we're facing. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Maybe we can take another look at it. Yeah. See if we I mean, can. I know, I know my scouting dot, you know, the, the, my scouting dot org information I know is correct. And I know I get emails from my council. So I know that's correct. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I don't know which, you know, as an IT person, which database, needs to be updated from which database, but it seems that if you're running background checks on people and that like somebody's got the right information or they wouldn't be able to be registered with BSA and it's not keystrokes, it should be file loads. Well, we're, we're pretty low on the food chain with regards to IT support. So all I can tell you, Bill, is that we're doing the best we can. Yeah. Okay, so. That's uh, fine. All right, so thanks. We yeah. appreciate your, your I'll, I'll go and register, but yeah, just it, it's you know, helpful for folks to you know know what's going on. I'm not getting the wrong link. I mean, Walt's got the right email for me, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you know, which is which. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, no, it doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in. Um, so this concludes uh, tonight's uh, roundtable event. I'd like to thank everybody again for uh, for attending, and I'd like to also give a big thanks to all the presenters tonight. Um, a lot of great information, and uh, it looks like the next date will be December 21st um, for the next uh, quarterly roundtable. Thank you for coming. Everybody, have a good night. Thank you.